study finds nearly half of jobs are vulnerable to automation. So what I'm going to do in this lecture is give you a sense of how to understand these kinds of headlines, where to be careful about the interpretation of it, and how it relates to diversity. What kinds of automation are we talking about? This lumps together, and later we'll separate them. Robots, which mainly replace routine manual tasks, by routine meaning it's predictable and um, programmable. Software, which is mainly routine cognitive tasks, anything that you have on your computer that makes it easier. And then finally, machine learning, which is just coming up, where machines can actually uh, replace cognitive tasks, non-routine cognitive tasks as well. What was really interesting about the first lecture, to me at least, um, was the fact that you kind of were looking at how automation can kind of have a gendered effect. So um, there's something called like bottleneck kind of tasks, and they're tasks that are done um, that AI cannot possibly replace all robots and machines. And those kinds of um, skills, those bottleneck tasks, are kind of um, more done by women in society. So as such, it's kind of looking like, in terms of future trends, that um, women are going to be the ones who are going to end up getting those sorts of jobs disproportionately compared to men, as more and more men's jobs are kind of being taken over by automation, which I find really interesting. And I can't wait to see kind of the solutions that people are going to come up with uh, to kind of try and rectify that sort of imbalance that's potentially coming up soon. Yeah. And so, even though I've shown you all the data for women, it also requires more uh, diversity in general to pick up on the machine learning that is biased. All these things, social intelligence in the sense of cultural sensitivities, will, uh, is becoming more important and will become even more important. I work at Malala Fund and we work on girls education and we work with, in our program countries, we work with the local activists on three major issues which is financing for education, quality for education and tackling the social norms against the girls education. I think this, um, this particular event has been really cutting across all these three, uh, three broader areas that we work with and I think this is the learnings that I gained today I can really take back to my work. So what we see is that in many scientific um, occupations, women have gained just as much um, in terms of percent in employed as they have in more interactive tasks uh, or jobs like pharmacists or physicians, etc. So there's a 14 percentage point increase and that's what we keep on pushing in schools, that's what we read about. Girls need to go into STEM, girls need to go into STEM. And so we get them in there, to a degree, but what we see is that women left to their own devices choose to go into the more interactive occupation where the underlying skills are very similar. What's the um, risk of automation, the exposure to uh, machine learning? 85% for chemical scientists, and only 17% for pharmacists. Renee this afternoon um, had some really interesting data which backed up some of, um, some of the suppositions I've made through my life in trying to get more women into leadership and more diversity in businesses. Uh, and she also had some really great data that busted quite a few myths. Uh, not least the fact that um, everyone trots out this thing about women are not risk takers. Women, as we know as women, are entirely uh, uh, driven by risk taking. We do it every day of our lives because we have so many things to juggle. About a quarter of countries worldwide have a policy that um, tells listed companies that they should have more board diversity. The primary rationales um, for the initial sort of gender diversity movement uh, on boards was um, uh, not just utility, which is the business case argument, but was also justice. So the idea that, well, it's just fair, 
to have women represented on board because they represent like half the population, right? Um, and also, uh, if you talk about a democratic country, uh, women should have equal sort of say. So now, what are the expected outcomes of the policy movement? Uh, well, so uh, if you believe the business case story, then clearly expected outcomes would be better company performance. So this is the narrative. Okay, fine. So um, I'm gonna take this narrative seriously because if you want to argue that um, women will increase firm performance and you know, be able to achieve all of these amazing things while also you know, having kids and you know, blah, 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 all these other things, right? Um, then you know, it must be the case that women are like superheroes. So let's look at whether women are superheroes. Uh, female directors exhibit more superhero values than male directors and they look more like superheroes than independent directors do. Okay, so then the question is, well, do they save the economy? Uh, and you could imagine that when women have more choices over how to develop their human capital, uh, that's when their sort of positive characteristics uh, could really manifest themselves. Um, so to achieve the justice and utility objectives of policies, um, you know, my argument is that policy should really treat the disease, not the symptoms. Yes, we want to have women represented on boards, but actually what the data tells us is that it's a very small sample. Um, it doesn't represent the whole population and, and actually there's nothing to support the fact that women on boards drives performance in our organisations. So what that tells me is we need to do more research into what's going on with gender and actually is it more to do with our societal norms than any policy or quota um, or, or intervention in that way. Looking at the data obviously uh, shows that we potentially have a leadership crisis in females more so than a gender inequality um, issue. My key takeaway would be that we need to focus on developing strong leadership traits in women to model for generations to come. So my lecture is on how diversity impacts the macroeconomy and basically I'm arguing that there's a lot of very good evidence now that we know that diversity can have positive economic effects in terms of innovation, in terms of higher wages for people um, both in the sort of diverse parts of the economy and spilling over into other parts of the economy. But we know that these benefits tend to be much higher in context of having inclusive institutions. So I think it's more progressive to think about how we overcome those costs and how we create situations where we do make sure that we feel the benefits of diversity. And I'm going to give you two examples of areas where we know that diversity has got strong, positive economic output. Diversity and in innovation, diversity serves as a sort of production complementarity, is the way that it's called in these innovation studies. And when I talk about diversity here, I don't just mean ethnic or cultural or diversity from country of birth or any of that stuff. I mean diversity in terms of gender and also diversity in terms of age, because we have some excellent studies on this. Because it brings a larger set of ideas and perspectives external linkages, complementarities between different sort of knowledge bases. The diversity in scientific teams allows cross-fertilization, spillovers, the search for sort of novel combinations, drawing in knowledge from external sources, and of course, absorptive capacity. I'm gonna give you a but, and the but is, I think, also comes from this evidence base on cities and regions, which is that I think actually, you know, Kuwait's rich, it's very diverse, there's something which is going on in places like Kuwait which is not allowing them to sort of benefit from this diversity. And so my argument here is that there is something around institutions which is missing. And by institutions, I don't mean like the BBC or University of Oxford, I mean these sort of informal institutions which really matter to shape the economy. But the question is, how do you build those inclusive institutions? And I'll be honest, the, the thing here is that you know, I don't have a clear answer but we do know that they are important. We do know that they are hugely important. So my question for the people watching is going to be how can we build those inclusive institutions? Because we know that they're important from the economic work, but actually for the people who are here, many of whom work in business, um, there's a lot which can be done on the ground to try and build up trust, make sure that diverse teams work, and so on. We have sometimes uh, the demand for these connections to happen from both sides, from, from firms and, and from, uh, from academic, academics, and these interactions often don't happen, so like, I think this is a fantastic place for, for that to happen and, and to exchange ideas and potential collaborations to emerge.